On March 13th, 2018, the world lost its most famous theoretical physicist. Stephen Hawking lived for more than 56 years with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is also more commonly known as ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Roughly 10% of those diagnosed with ALS will survive for even 10 years, but Hawking survived and even prospered for five times that long. In fact, at the time of his death, he may have been the longest ALS survivor in recorded history, but in the end, its effects did cause his death. There are Stephen Hawking biographies and tributes absolutely everywhere, and many of them are much better than anything I could produce. So instead, let's have a look at what became Hawking's signature in everything from lectures he delivered at conferences to episodes of The Simpsons, his synthesized voice. It became so synonymous with Hawking that the voice is trademarked. But how did it work, and how did it change over the years? Up until 1985, Professor Hawking still had some ability to speak naturally. However, the effects of ALS caused him to mumble and slur to an extent where he required a translator to produce intelligible words. There are precious few publicly available recordings of his natural voice from the pre-1985 era, mostly because he simply wasn't a household name at the time. But here's a short example of how he sounded, including the voice of his translator. It may be. The universe did not really have a beginning. And maybe that space time forms a close surface without an edge, rather like the surface of the Earth. In 1985, he underwent an emergency tracheostomy during a potentially fatal bout of pneumonia, and that took his remaining speech ability away forever. For the first year after his tracheostomy, Hawking used a method called partner-assisted scanning to communicate. If you're a fan of the Breaking Bad TV series, it was a similar method to what Hector Salamanca used in a Season 4 episode. Unlike the evil Salamanca who used a bell to make a selection, though, Hawking would just raise an eyebrow. A. E. I. Row I. I. J, K, L, M, N, first letter N, A, E, row E, E, second letter E. As you would probably guess, it was a painfully laborious process, especially when writing lengthy research papers and speeches. So in 1986, Hawking adopted a fledgling technology created by a company called Words Plus. The software was called Equalizer, and it originally ran on an Apple II computer and linked to a voice synthesizer created by a company called Speech Plus. The Equalizer functioned similarly to the partner-assisted scanning, but instead of raising an eyebrow, Hawking could press a button on a controller and select characters and words to create phrases for the voice synthesizer to speak aloud. It worked pretty well for him, but things like accurate predictive text were barely vague fantasies in the mid-1980s, so the process was still very slow. At best, Hawking could achieve 15 words per minute. By comparison, even a decent keyboard typist can produce around 50 words per minute. Over the next 10 years, Hawking's computer hardware gradually improved and he switched away from the Apple platform to a Microsoft Windows-based computer. But the rest of the setup stayed largely the same. In 1997, Hawking accidentally met Gordon Moore, one of Intel's founders, at a conference. For the rest of his life, Hawking was sponsored by Intel and a small team of engineers worked on improving Hawking's method of communication as his physical abilities continued to diminish. When he finally lost the ability to operate the selector switch with his hand in 2008, his research assistant devised a miniature system where a weak infrared beam projected onto his cheek and a sensor picked up the reflected beam to detect cheek muscle twitches. It functioned much the same as the hand button had before. Rows of text and words flowed across the screen and Hawking twitched his face to stop the cursor over the text that he wanted to use. By then, his equalizer software had been updated to another Words Plus product called Easy Keys, which also included basic predictive text. It was far from cutting edge, but Hawking knew it well. Even so, the ALS continued to attack his body, and Hawking's speed dropped to one word per minute by 2012. Hawking asked Intel for improvement ideas, and the team of engineers hunkered down. Hawking had tried eye recognition software in the past, but his drooping eyelids caused problems. He also tried wearing a cap with sensors that captured brain waves, but the sensors couldn't seem to pick up Hawking's brain signals. Yep. A man known for his intellect apparently had unusually weak brainwaves. So, Intel started from nearly scratch to offer Hawking something more than just an incremental upgrade. The end result was software called Aster. 
But Hawking quickly became frustrated with the changes, and he struggled to get used to a new way of doing things. It's easy to forget that he was a grandfather-aged man who had virtually no experience with modern technology. Smartphones and intuitive prediction were all things that he'd only seen but never used. It's one thing to learn slowly for recreational purposes, but when it's someone's only method of communication, a steep learning curve is a much different problem. So Intel tried again. They developed a more familiar interface with changes that he specifically wanted and called the new system ACAT. He now had a mute button to prevent the voice synthesizer from speaking gibberish when he accidentally triggered words while chewing or moving his jaw. He had a predictive text algorithm developed by a company called SwiftKey that would sniff out Hawking's intent rather than just logical words. Intel imported years of his research papers and lectures to allow the software to learn his patterns. For example, when Hawking typed the word black, his next selected word was usually whole. And that's what the software predicted. And it worked. Hawking's physical state continued to fail, but he was able to communicate reasonably well up to the end of his life. He could browse the web, write email, and of course, watch wild AC videos. Perhaps the most interesting part of the whole story, though, is the voice itself. It sounds like a comically outdated robot voice from a 30-year-old cartoon. Because it is. It was based on recordings done in the early 1980s by an MIT engineer named Dennis Klatt, and Hawking rejected any changes to make the voice sound more modern and natural, or to more closely mimic his native accent. The recordings were part of an early synthetic male voice package called Perfect Paul. In 2006, Hawking said, I keep it because I've not heard a voice I like better, and because I've identified with it. Hawking's research assistant Jonathan Wood went to great lengths to hunt down the original Perfect Paul recordings on a dusty backup tape in the Speech Plus archives, despite the fact that the company had been sold and amalgamated many times over the last 40 years. And that's the voice that Hawking used until the very end. Perfect Paul was used for all kinds of telemarketing and voicemail services in the 1980s and 90s, but it's more or less become the Stephen Hawking voice, and probably always will be. Despite not speaking a word for more than 30 years, his voice is more recognizable than most other celebrities. And maybe that's one of the many tributes to a man who is part of a very small group that made science cool again. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe for more from the Wild AC channel. Thanks for watching.